As Leo mentioned, I'm Mike Maxey. I work with Pivotal. I'm part of the corporate development team. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, what I thought I could do first is just have everybody introduce themselves. Everybody knows Leo. He just spoke. But if we could go through the line and sort of uh, speak about uh, who you are, where you're from, and good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Atwood, and I work with Hewlett Packard. I've been involved for many years with OpenStack, and now I'm very excited to be involved with Cloud Foundry. Hi, Dan Chiquette, uh, Rackspace. Um, very ecstatic to be here. Uh, obviously very excited to be part of the Cloud Foundry uh, formation of the foundation. Been a uh, part of the OpenStack Foundation for you know, a few years now. Hi, I'm Chris Ferris. Uh, I'm an MBM Distinguished Engineer, and uh, uh, I've been working very closely with Pivotal pretty much for about a year now on, on helping us get to where we are. Hey, I'm uh, Killian Murphy. I'm at VMware. Um, delighted to be here. It's, uh, I've been working on Cloud Foundry since uh, April of 2010 now, I guess, just a little over four years. And really delighted that uh, you know, Paul's original vision around open sourcing Cloud Foundry is you know, really moving forward with the formation of the foundation. So it's pretty awesome to be part of that. My name is Eric Lauer. I'm heading up the industry standards and open source team from SAP. Um, I'm also delighted to be here, and what you also can hear, now Cloud Foundry also moves to Europe, <laughs> so it's really getting global. Yeah, and I'm Jared Ray. I'm the CTO of Cloud at CenturyLink. I also created the Iron Foundry project. Very happy to be here. Great. All right, so big panel. Uh, so let's dive into it. Uh, what I thought we could start with is if each of you could give us an overview of why the companies you represent are participating in Cloud Foundry, and even more so why in the foundation itself. And Leo, I, th I think maybe you covered ours in the intro. If there's sure. anything you want to add or? No, please. So Hewlett Packard has um, famously made a very large bet on cloud computing um, and um, the new branding, HP on Helion Cloud. And Helion is for the, um, the foundation of it is OpenStack, but infrastructure is not enough to provide cloud computing to enterprise and to users. We need to have a platform layer as well, and we've decided that the platform that we want to use is the Cloud Foundry. So Rackspace, as you all know, is a service company. Uh, the success of our customers is of great importance to our success. Many of our customers have been asking Rackspace to provide services around platform as a service. And through conversations that we've had with our customers, they've expressed a great deal of interest to uh, have Rackspace work with them on Cloud Foundry specifically. Um, you know, furthermore, an open source project is, is always an exciting thing for, for Rackspace to be involved in, and with this particular project, it's no different than OpenStack, so we're, again, very happy to be part of the project. So from an, <clears throat> from, from an IBM perspective, you know, we, we were looking, oh, about a year and a half, maybe even almost two years ago, we were looking for a sort of a developer-centric application platform as a service uh, to complement the work that we've been doing around IBM pure scale and so forth. Um, uh, that was focused on sort of standing up middleware, but we wanted to provide something that was really oriented towards the developer, and, uh, and we wanted to have something that was open. That was, I think, the most fundamental thing, was something that was based on open source and open standards, and, and Cloud Foundry was a clear leader in terms of that and in terms of providing sort of uh, a, a, an existing ecosystem, right, that, that we could uh, engage uh, immediately. So that was very important to us, and, and it's it just continued to grow since then. So I think we've been very pleased with this. Yeah, so um, from VMware's point of view, um, obviously as the pioneer of virtualization, the underlying technology in, in most clouds out there, um, we wanted to be involved in making sure that developers would have a, a fantastic experience using uh, clouds or using, using our technology, whether in their own data center or for that matter in a public data center. And so, um, we, you know, actually under Paul's leadership originally, we, we kicked off the Cloud Foundry effort to make sure developers could actually uh, be extremely agile, get a great, a great user experience in, in deploying, managing applications on top of our technologies. Um, and so uh, participating in the foundation, you know, obviously a, a logical extension of our, our original uh, commitment to this project, we still want to achieve exactly those things. We want to make sure that developers building, so, building software have a fantastic opportunity in deploying and managing their apps, whether in their own data center or in a public data center, uh, running on, in our case, VMware's technology. I mean, from SAP perspective, we are already, our main goal or our main focus is our applications. 
And right now, many applications are moving to mobile. They're moving to the cloud. And we think with Cloud Foundry, we have an excellent platform going forward as well that we can use to, to build applications on top. Another perspective, of course, is as well, as you see probably from the press and if you hear from our customers, that we are going to be more and more open. This is why we have um, opened up our um, UI um, technology with OpenUI 5. We are opening up the UI technology as well for our customers. So Cloud Foundry here as well gives us another opportunity to be more, more open to our customers, but also for, to our ecosystem, because we also want that other ISVs and customers can build on this technology and then as well then connect it to our applications. You know, uh, normally I'd like to just joke and say something like, we're CenturyLink and we're hoping that all of our people using dial-up access or phone lines are gonna become developers and use Cloud Foundry. But, um, you know, for us, this really comes down to two, full, you know, two aspects of CenturyLink. CenturyLink acquired a, a tier three in AppFog and we are big open source pro, you know, people and we want to keep that movement going and CenturyLink has fully embraced that not only internally with what they're building and how they're building their internal in infrastructure and they wanna do that in a community that they can contribute back to. But also we see on the other side, like for, for instance, CenturyLink Cloud, our customers want to have an experience that they can get applications up and running extremely fast, very simple, and really without the burden of the operating system layer. And you know, to top that off, and we're big on this, no lock-in. Like this is one of the biggest things. It's not hardware, it's not virtual, it's not anywhere. And coming from a service provider, I never want to lock in at my customers. I, if I was a customer, I would hate that too. So no lock in. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, as Paul mentioned in the uh, in the intro, IBM <coughs> got involved very earlier. So Chris, maybe I'll throw this one to you, and then others, please dive in. But. You know, why is it important that we come together now? Like, well, why, why all this energy and, and why are we seeing all this demand around Cloud Foundry and the 35 partners we've signed up? And so, Chris, why don't we start with you and then others, please dial in. Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, it's, it, there's a couple of functions that, that play into this. Number one, I think it's a, it's a good piece of technology, right? So it's, a, it's accomplishing its objectives on that role. But, um, you know, as an open source project, I think the thing that, that sort of takes us to the next level is getting it to a point where there is, you know, so where, where the community can come together and they drive the direction as opposed to a single vendor. Uh, you know, no offense to Pivotal, you guys are doing a great job, but really to get everybody else sort of really, you know, truly sort of pulling their equal weight, I think, you know, it really needs to be taken to the next level and taken to an open foundation. I think we saw that with OpenStack in particular, um, uh, but with a number of others, is uh, another other, number of other examples you know we've seen where take a technology that's that's essentially driven by a single vendor it goes to an open foundation like eclipse like openstack and it just explodes in something that's really wonderful and benefits everybody equally great Killian? yeah hey so um i i think <coughs> the original goal around open sourcing this you know was to was was to get a, an ecosystem of people mm -hmm. to help us build this right yep it, it really was and so um, you know, we, we tried early on. James Waters had the, the difficult task of, of working with that. He worked with people like Jared in the early days. They bled from their eyes. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and, so, and, you know, no question. We, you know, it, it was tough for, you know, for us to figure out how to scale, how to deal with, uh, how to work with people and so on. And, and as it's transitioned to Pivotal, we've done that better and better. But uh, the, the other thing is it's getting the product to a state of maturity where a whole bunch of people can take it in different directions, yep. and you can still expect to have something usable at the end of the day. That's, a, that's a, you know, a good place to be at. That is, I think that is the reason why now, right? The reason why now is because this, this project is at a state of maturity now, where, okay, it's not, you know, it, it, it's not like an end-of-life product or anything like that. It's a start-of-life product, yeah. but it's not you know, completely you know, very, very, very early stage. It's at a stage where people are actually building and shipping commercial products and making money with Cloud Foundry today, but it's early days still. And yep. there's plenty more we can do and plenty more we can add. And so that's why now. I Great. think also maybe just one more point. I mean, I think the macro environment's changed. Uh, I, I think all of the users and consumers of technology expect change to happen 
rapidly. I mean, they're used to being able to get on a Google system and know that Google is changing it while they're actually making searches. And I think that you know, enterprises are looking for ways to change the way they think about building software and with new methods like agile and radical development. Having this operating system, if you will, at the basis of it really enables, I think, people to change and think about how they're writing software. So I think that's also a piece of it too. Mm. I think part of what happened was is developers have gotten more comfortable with the kind of development model that the platform as a service provides. We, went th we have a couple of companies that introduced it, but only hosted in their data centers in a proprietary manner. And while that was awesome and very good for the users, for the agility developers and the developers' employers started seeing the problems there. And Cloud Foundry is the first open source pass that really lends itself to being multi-vendor provided Okay, great. Well, maybe let's transition to sort of the users and what's driving adoption. So what's driving PaaS adoption now? And I don't know, Jared, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen actually tremendous growth even from Iron Foundry. Iron Foundry is a .NET extension. Yes, that evil word that everybody hates. Um, but, you know, for .NET and Windows, we literally see requests coming in every single day of people spinning up environments, getting up and running. Um, I think even out of this panel, there's a lot of you already running even Iron Foundry. And the community has changed rapidly. It's gone from even a couple people to, I mean, last, last uh, summit we did, I think there was 400 to 600. And now we even have more backing and more con contribution. And that, that's been pretty mind-blowing for, for me. Um, someone who, literally, I remember talking to James and the team at v VMware, and they're like, whoa, you know .NET. Can, can you build something for us? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's quite changed. And, and the cool thing about it, and this is what it all gets down to, use, like, this whole idea of using Cloud Foundry, when you see the delight on a developer's face, that is what Cloud Foundry is. It is making someone launch an application better than anybody else. And that is what Cloud Foundry is. No must, no fuss, getting up and running and getting their stuff done. I think also the developer community doesn't want to be burdened by the concerns of the infrastructure. At least at Rackspace, we have customers that run applications on public cloud, private cloud, our managed virtualization platform, our hosting platform, and they don't want to be concerned about that. So by having a, a a platform as a service, but more importantly, Cloud Foundry, it gives them that flexibility and it removes that angst, if you will, of designing applications based on infrastructure where they just need to worry about the application running on a platform. All right, anybody else want to weigh in on what's driving paths today? I think any... Developers, developers, developers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, have to, uh, you have to jump around waving your arms. Yeah, exactly. when you say that. <laughs> it's speed, speed, speed. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. the advantage of a PaaS means that you can, you can update your live application as fast as you can push to source control. <clears throat> sure. And it's, I remember the very first time I pushed an application to a PaaS and started it up, and I started to swear because I realized we had all the parts to do this in the early 90s, but it just wasn't time for it all to come together in people's heads why this was valuable and why this was useful. Got it. I think um, you know, time, any time spent not doing stuff that differentiates your business is kind of time wasted, right? And, and uh, you know, th that's a nice, a polite way of, of talking about um, uh, what one of the Cloud Foundry developers was talking about in the videos earlier on, right? We don't want to hand off their app to <laughs> IT guys and try and train them how to deploy the app and stuff, right? I've been talking about Cloud Foundry for a few years, and, and uh, in the early days, I'd started out with PowerPoint and talk about it on and on and on. And, and what I discovered was, you know, the, the best presentation on Cloud Foundry starts with demoing Cloud Foundry. And so it, it saves you, you know, 45 minutes of explaining. And you just show it, and okay, now they get that, right? And so that's it. It's just do stuff fast, do it quick, and don't have to mess around with stuff that okay. doesn't matter to you. Okay, great. Uh, so let's pivot maybe to some technical questions. So, so in your view of the panel here, and, and maybe we'll start with, uh, I don't know, you guys choose who starts. Why is Cloud Foundry the right technical choice? I know a number of you have looked at many and, and sort yeah. of come to Cloud Foundry. I know, Killian, you started very early with the Cloud Foundry project. So yeah, and, we'd love to hear sort of the technical view on, on why Cloud Foundry is the right choice. I, I'll, I'll start. I mean, well, firstly, you know, I have an unusual opportunity for an Irish person. I'm between 800 people and a beer. So I'm going <laughs> to talk as much as I possibly can. 
I, I warn you, I did kiss the Blarney Stone when I was 12 years old, so I can go all night. Um, okay, so, so to me, uh, um, why Cloud Foundry? Look, Cloud Foundry, uh, you know, we've, we talk about it as a PaaS all the time. It, it's really a software project, right? Um, so unlike a whole bunch of these things, which are services that come from a single vendor, uh, similar, similar type services, uh, this is actually a software project you can download, you can deploy, right? You know, the, the, the most popular thing when, when I was doing it in, in VMware, you know, people would take Micro Cloud Foundry and deploy it on their laptop, right? And, and, or try it out on cloudfoundry.com, now run Pivotal IO, right? Try a quick and easy service, right? But you could, you could put it in your own data center. You could put it in, in, in a public cloud. You could put it in lots of different places. And that ability to choose where you want to put it is a really big deal, right? The fact that it's open source, you can see what it's actually doing. You can add capabilities to it, like Jared did in Co, right? And so, you know, fundamentally, that's what it's about. You can, you can own it yourself as an open source person. You can get a commercial product, deploy it wherever you want, a huge amount of choice around what services you want to use, what application languages you want to use. How am I doing on the beer front? Okay. <laughs> I'll so, stop. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, from, from an IBM perspective, you know, we, when we started down this path with Bluemix, you know, the, the first thing we did was we spent about two, three months sort of standing up OpenStack and putting Cloud Foundry on top. And then, you know, well, that works. And it was pretty solid. And we were, you know, so somebody challenged us, to, to, you know, right after we had done that first goal and said, what should have a hackathon in a month and open it up to, let's say, 500 IBMers to come in and pound on this thing. And, you know, we were, you know, really sweating bullets, you know, hoping that this thing would stand up. And, oh, my God, it just worked. It was amazing. And so, so that helped, you know, significantly in, in terms of, of our, uh, you know, building our confidence that this was the right choice that we had made. But it wasn't really the technology necessarily that, 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 was, that drove us, it was the existing ecosystem that really excited us. The, the services that were there, you know, it was the other providers. Because again, you don't wanna have something that's just one vendor. Nobody wants that vendor lock. They want this sort of ecosystem of capability that they can get from a, a number of different sources. And so that's really, I think, what drove us. Okay. Jared? You know, I'd probably say technology-wise, um, what's really different about Cloud Foundry and even now is just not only the robust capability, but the ability to work with the team. I mean, Iron Foundry's gone through the incubation process, and we've gone, you know, we're, we're still in it. We're going to basically get that all done, and literally we can work with the entire team, all the people across the board, all working at the same moment. And... Technology-wise, the architecture is very sound. Um, this is something that we actually struggled with a lot with you know, other platform as a service offerings that we were looking at for a long time, and the architecture wasn't there. It wasn't built the way we would build it, especially at a, at a distributed system level. It really didn't have that fundamental of what are your apps doing, what are your services. It was bundling, you know, most PaaSes bundle them all together or try and connect them at some point. And this actually kept it extremely loosely coupled, but gave you the agility to have them all bind together. And that was a huge turning point for the way we looked at it. And then, you know, even to the fact that we were able to include, like, Iron Foundry into it. Um, that's a, most people don't even want to do something like that, and we were able to do that. And I mean, IBM's doing a lot of stuff around that also, um, being able to include some of your guys' stack. So, you know, that is a major change in the way that you look at how platforms are built. Great. So, so, so you mentioned incubation. I mean, Leo, can you maybe just tell the audience what, what the point of incubation is? And, and he referenced that quickly. And, and I think that'll help folks understand what he's talking about there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's new to just uh, the Cloud Foundry environment. I, I think that it's the notion that um, you know, folks can work on new ideas, you know, whether they be you know, a service or an application or some component of the system, and, uh, and then there will be a formal process by which they can work through uh, these committees to essentially present it to the, to the group or the foundation and allow it to become part of what is Cloud Foundry. So it's, it's really a way to, to allow people to experiment and do and try new things, essentially. Yeah, that's a, that's a great description. I, I think what we've done is, as we've built a foundation, is we've done a good job of keeping the technical decisions and the developers involved in making those decisions and keeping the business folks out of the way. Uh, and as we start to share more in the coming year, as Leo mentioned, you'll learn more about that. And you know, I, th I think your experience in the incubator, Jared, is, is a good example of how the community is sort of getting behind the project and you know, Pivotal and IBM and others, et cetera. 
Um, so Eric, maybe let me throw this question to you. Um, and anyone dial in here, of course, but where do we see this going in five years? What's the future of PaaS? What's the future of Cloud Foundry? You know, maybe from an SAP perspective, you know, where, do you, where do you see this technology helping your business? And we'd love to hear from the other panelists as well. What I said before, I mean, the, the whole applications are working, moving into the cloud. The people are subscribing these on demand. And what we need is a scalable platform below, which really scales on-premise, in the cloud, however you would like to, to see it. And where it's in the future, I mean, for me, it's clear that we need one um, platform as a service as well to enrich the ecosystem. Because it's not that we are sitting here together. I hope also in the future we are working together. So there are some, some companies, they build applications. We make sure that below the interoperability is given through one platform, which, and you, I said it before, I'm also responsible for the industry standards, which really gives us a standard that um, all these fits together. And I mean, this is very important because we, we all get some pressure as well from, from the market because the cost has to go down, and the customers are pressuring us. So if we build this together, I assume that overall the cost for this kind of um, platform in between also goes down. And it's more flexible, it's interoperable, interoperable, okay. <laughs> I try for next time. But you know what I mean? So this is really important for us, and I think for the others as well. Really important for enterprise applications. Um, what I see in two, three, four years is, is that an enterprise application, just as matter of course, comes packaged to run as, um, as a Cloud Foundry PaaS app. And that service providers, um, both ones providing applications that run in your data center or service providers that provide a service out on the internet, the way that they consider bringing that service to enterprises is by having the Cloud Foundry connector or service, and that's what they deliver for, and that's what they expect you to run, rather than expect you to build your own glue and your own adapters and stuff. It'll all just be assuming that it's Cloud Foundry. I think if you were to look at the OpenStack project, and that certainly is a project that can improve code quality and other things, but what makes OpenStack such a vibrant, powerful community is it has an, a, a structure in which allows for innovation, for creativity, and the opportunity to be very collaborative between the developer and the user. And I think if, if we ensure that the Cloud Foundry project follows those same basic principles, along with ensuring that as development and innovation come together, as long as we're, we're able to ensure that that process is, is matrixed with how the community develops, then it's gonna be a successful foundation for years to come. Okay. So I think, you know, if I look out and say, you know, think about five years from now, I think, you know, today we would look at Cloud Foundry and say, you can actually, you can use it for, you know, for the 80% of use cases for deploying an app, you know, a cloud-based web horizontally scaling app, uh, you know, the, the Instagrams and the Twitters, probably, you know, you need a little bit more horsepower in order to drive those kinds of applications. But I think in five years, we actually get to a point where those are, that, that potential exists, right? Um, and and uh, so I'm really excited about that. But the, the real important thing I think that we can see in the next five years is that that list of service providers becomes just th all of them, exactly, exactly right. And, and, and that they, uh, many of them, I think, will be open source enabled. Um, and there will be multiple providers of those services. Um, and then there will obviously be you know, a number of proprietary things. But essentially, it's, it's that service composition environment that I think is a really exciting part of what Bluemix enables. Because it's, it's, it's all about that API, API economy. Yeah. Great. Anyone else want to predict the future? Maybe one that's my personal vision on this that we are not talking about cloud on-premise on anymore, that we get a layer with Cloud Foundry which just makes it invisible. doesn't matter where it really runs. If it's in the cloud, if it's on-premise, 
Me, as a user of an application, I don't care. It just runs. And my vision my, is, is then that the applications on top, that they are really connected globally, which means I have a, a purchase order somewhere running in, in Munich and a, a credit card verification which runs somewhere in Houston, Texas. So on the application layer above, it just doesn't matter where the platform runs. And so this is really going where I think it. So, so, so PaaS is, is kind of fundamentally different from infrastructure as a service and infrastructures in general. In, in one particular, well, there's a number of ways, of course, but one, one particularly interesting way to me is that it, the PaaS layer understands the concept of an application, right? And so now you can do things with the concept of an application that when you're running the infrastructure, when you just own the infrastructure layer, you don't know which VMs are the application, right? You're running a whole bunch of VMs, and these are these ones, and those are those ones, and you don't, you don't really know what they are. And so when you know which, what makes up an application, you can do stuff with that in interesting ways. And I'm, I'm hoping a whole bunch of those are things that I don't know today. I mean, some of the obvious ones today are, for example, you can grant the right to manage an application um, to some people and not other people. And, and a lot of people who run infrastructure would prefer that right, would prefer to be able to divide things up. It, it, it um, means that, for example, if in, you're using Cloud Foundry and you're binding, it, uh, binding applications to services and so on, it's really, really easy to back out the dependency graph. Right? This app depends on this service, which depends on this one, depends on that app, and so on. Right? That's a hard thing to do when you're running an infrastructure layer. Right? It, it, there's various other things. It's really easy to figure out, well, which apps have a heart bleed problem? And let's go fix that and just fix it across all of the apps, right? Because we know exactly what stacks all our apps are running. And it's really, really easy to make them run on a different stack if we want to, right? So there's a set, you know, these are some sort of obvious things today. Uh, with that abstraction, right, where you've now up leveled to an application, a service, instances of an application, a few things like that, right? You know, you've up leveled a bunch of these abstractions. I'm really hoping there's a whole bunch of really great things we can, we can do with it. Um, that you know we can't predict yet, right? But um, applications, you know, first or coming first. I saw one of the sponsors is called App First, right? App First it seems like a really interesting, um, you know, a really interesting thing to start with. You know? I, I think just to, just to add to that, I think the other thing that I think it does over the course of the next five years is it changes the nature of how we do development in an enterprise, how we deliver applications in an enterprise. I think changes fundamentally, yeah. right? Because it's not your, it's. It's not the same. It's completely different. It's definitely focused towards the developer, focused towards sort of a DevOps-enabled kind of env uh, right. uh, environment. Right. Well, it's not really DevOps anymore. The, the ultimate goal of a PaaS-type system is to be able to, once again, turn the DevOps person back into a Dev person. The ops stuff, while becoming much more important, is much more automated. So uh, here's a question that I think is sort of near and dear to the developers in the audience, and, and that is, um, is it a requirement to wear a hoodie if you're going to contribute to Cloud Foundry? <laughs> Killian, we'll throw that to you, so given you're wearing the hoodie. I don't, I, <laughs> clearly, nobody else got the memo from James Waters. <laughs> the official uniform of Cloud Foundry is a hoodie. I'm sorry, sorry. but it just is. I just don't do hoodies. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I, I think the experience, and, and we didn't get a t chance to do deep introductions, but hopefully you had a chance to, to uh, look up some of the folks on the, on the panel here. A lot of experience in open source, a lot of experience in building foundations. So, you know, given that experience, you know, what are you bringing from, you know, OpenStack and Eclipse and the many other foundations you've, you've worked on to the Cloud Foundry Foundation and to the community, and, and what can we all sort of learn and make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes and make new mistakes? I think the exciting thing is, is that we now have, we as an industry have enough experience starting up open source foundations that we have mistakes that we've learned from. Yeah. It is, is in some respects a third or fourth generation open source um, project. And it's very exciting to be able to sit down and instead of coming up for this from the scratch, we can say, well, we're going to take this from Eclipse, we're going to take this from OpenStack, we're going to take this from Apache and we all know what we're talking about, and then the people on the legal side know what we're talking about, and the people on the business and the development side know what we're talking about. It's we're standing on the shoulders of giants here, and we're very grateful for what has been done by, is going all the way back to the Unix Times and the Sin Mail Group, and then BSD, and then Apache, and so on up to what we have now. And, and how do you think that 
you know, the world has changed a bit. I mean, big corporations are now supporting open source when we used to be very afraid of it, and contributions are coming more and more from big enterprises, et cetera. I mean, a, as you build this foundation, how are you balancing the individual and, and, and the corporation, and what's the right model for that? Uh, so, uh, I didn't uh, warn them on this question, by the way. That's, that's why they're all stumbling. That's a hell of a question. <laughs> so, again, I think, you know, as, as, as sort of Leo hinted at a little bit earlier, we're trying to keep sort of the, the business guys out from meddling with the technology aspect of things. Let the, let the project sort of, you know, sort of go their own way, you know, fit, find their own way in that, in that path. And I think there's an awful lot that they can learn from past experience. And, and a lot of open source developers, frankly, are... Are, are not necessarily, you know, unique to a particular project. You know, many of them will have worked on OpenStack or, you know, or they'll have worked in Apache in some, in some capacity in the past or Eclipse. And so, so this is not necessarily new to them and they can bring their experiences with them. And, and so, you know, generally these things sort of, they, they tend to take on a life of their own, which is, I think, you know, one of the fun parts of working in open source. You know, I do agree with you, Mike, that I, I think, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to enterprises and, I think they're much more open to this notion of, of open source, and they're very comfortable with the fact that you know uh, many many vendors are going to be working together. And uh, if you just add up the market cap of the 35 companies who are involved in uh, in Cloud Foundry, it's it's a pretty monumental commitment. So I think it's not just about um, the fact that it's open source. I think it's really about community. It's about companies coming together for the greater good. And I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for enterprises to frankly take advantage of that. And I think it'll help drive down IT costs. When I talk to CIOs and I ask them, you know, how, how much of your budget is on new stuff, you know, versus the old stuff, it, you know, you get that immediate, like, drop in the chair depression because, you know, so many companies are tied to their legacy systems. And I think in many ways, uh, Cloud Foundry and these new methods for developing solutions are, are a way to get beyond the past into the future. I think this is something we can be grateful again to OpenStack for, is previous open source business foundations, consortiums, the, each sub-project or each team were typically in, all inside the same company and they came together at some sort of integration level. Is my experience with OpenStack, it's um, you know, HP does about half the contribution to OpenStack Trove and roughly the other half comes from Rackspace and we work together at a developer to developer level. And the other projects, again, are split between companies that way. And we're, we're um, seeing and hoping that it continues to happen with Cloud Foundry. And then the other thing coming from OpenStack I see coming up to Cloud Foundry is sitting in these board meetings, in, in these board foundational meetings, one of the things that we're always working on as, as the business governance people is to make sure we have as little power as possible and while still guiding the project, and that the developers have as much power as possible, but in a way that is compatible and comfortable with their project managers at, their corporate, at the corporations that employ them. You know, the one thing I would probably say is, and you, you need to realize it is, you know, this is a lot of big companies. I, I'm actually from a startup that got acquired, so I'm gonna say I'm a small company, but it's a big company right now. And you, you need to realize one thing is that Cloud Foundry has really kept its roots on the open source and really that aggressive, rapid, new idea um, capability. They want to see innovation happen. And I think one thing that we all need to realize and part of this foundation, and I know everybody's really after this, is it's not just after the big companies, but innovation comes from all of you. Like, that's what this is all about. It's going to be you guys who create the next generation and really innovate on new ideas, new concepts that we've never seen before. And this is where you get to be involved. This is where you get to be able to contribute. And it's also where we can help you out. I talk to developers all the time just on the Iron Foundry stuff, and we talk about Go, we talk about Ruby, we talk about you know, new ways and new concepts of making things happen and stuff that a foundation is probably not gonna always hear. And open source now is really about that innovation. So it's you guys being able to contribute that. And I think that's where that balance is, right? It's not just about a whole bunch of big companies writing software, it's about you guys actually contributing and us helping you do that. Right. And it's not just vendors, it's, it's users and end users too. There's a number of end users that are contributing to Cloud Foundry in, in significant ways.
Totally true. We, um, when we started out, we actually uh, used Spring, the Spring project as a, uh, sort of guided us a little bit in the early days of the project. And as we're working together on this now, we're, lot, we're talking a lot about, you know, um, the, well, the, the open source world has changed a lot, right, in the, in the last few years. And so uh, people like OpenStack and Eclipse and so on. You know, it, it's, 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 it's interesting, right? We got some things right. We got some things wrong early on. You know, we'll probably do it again. And so I think uh, also feedback from, from you all, right, from the Cloud Foundry community in what is and isn't working will be really, really important. And, you know, hopefully we can be flexible enough and, and change the things that aren't working, right? And I, I, I certainly think that that's something that we all want to do, right? We have a few guiding principles, right? I, you know, from my point of view, they're, they're pretty reasonable and straightforward, right? Governance by contribution, that's an awesome guiding principle. So let's make sure that we hew to the, those guiding principles and then be flexible around what is and isn't working as, as we go along. Because it's actually kind of tough at the moment, right? The, you know, there's a whole bunch of big companies involved in these projects. There's a whole bunch of individuals and, and trying to make sure that the, the big business kind of gets its Get, get, gets involved in the right ways, but also that the, the project gets managed right for individuals as well is, is an interesting line to... to, to, to I, I, think, I think in the probably 50 or 60 hours worth of meetings that we've had over the past <laughs> two months, I think what we've, we've really tried to do a good job at is kind of being in the seat of the developer. Okay, if you know, this bylaw is to be said this way, okay, if I'm a developer, how does that, you know, even though it's not totally visible to them at this point, how is that going to impact or, or uh, motivate me to contribute, to innovate, and to, and to trust my fellow developer on how to you know, make this project really fly? And I think we've done a really good job at that. Yeah. So, so to that, we do want to take a couple questions from the audience. So if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. There should be a couple of folks walking around with mics. Um, while they're teeing up questions, I, I would also note uh, there is an unconference or birds of a feather, depending on what you want to call it, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so we're hoping to host a uh, foundation discussion. So bring your questions to that as well. Uh, a little difficult to see if anyone has questions. Hello. Uh, question to uh, Eric uh, from SAP. Um, are you planning to integrate any of your products uh, as integration services into Cloud Foundry? Is that in your roadmap? Yes, actually, we already started to have a service provider to, I would say, the best database in the world, to SAP HANA. So that was the first step that we did, and this will just continue right now. We are working with the engineers from Pivotal um, to bring our people up to speed, and then you will see that there are more um, services coming to connect these to our uh, products as well. Brave souls, you guys are thirsty. I can tell. <laughs> the sound guy's from Scotland. I think he wants to get his beer. So. <laughs> or he's angry that we beat them in rugby last year. Hi. Our question. Um, how important do you think it is uh, for providers or, or SME type providers of services uh, using Powered by Cloud Foundry to be involved in the open source community? So I believe the question was, how important is it for developers that are building services to be involved in the community? Is that correct? Yes. All right. Uh, who'd like to take that? Uh, pretty simply, one of the reasons uh, when we started out with Cloud Foundry what, to operate CloudFoundry.com was to gain experience from operating a service. So you know, software people, it's, it's easy to build software that can't be operated. And so if we can build software that can be operated, that's an even better thing. And so there's a, one really good reason for you to participate. Some of you guys might have something to add. So I, mean, I, I would just add you know, ways that we can uh, improve the way that we integrate services. I mean, there's been a number of improvements that we've made over time, the single sign-on for the service it. dashboard. I mean, it's like, you know, there's, there's tons of innovation that we still have left to do in terms of service integration. So getting service providers involved in that in helping to shape that, I think is fundamentally important to us. Okay, one last question, and I think we're out of time. How are you? Um, so, I think there was uh, some some mention of five years time. Uh, cl cloud brokering uh, is also very important as well. Can, can you can you comment on the direction of cloud brokering, and is it is it is it complementary to PaaS, and how are these things going to tick and tie together going forward? And uh, go on Ireland, by the way. 
Cloud brokering and PaaS, who'd like to take that one? They, they go together really well, um, but that, that, that turns into an example of it is better to create, it is easier to create the future than to predict it. It's, um, I'd like to say all of you or any of you who have ideas on, on the, in the existing cloud brokering technologies, or ideas for new ones, the PaaS is probably the easiest place to integrate that and we'd like to invite you to please do so and help drive that future. But, but I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, I think the vision of, of Cloud Foundry is to be infrastructure agnostic and to allow you to be able to write an application once and instrument it onto any infrastructure you want and onto any cloud. So, so I agree. I think it's, if, if you're looking for a place to build a brokerage model, this is probably a pretty good place to start. Great. Well, as I mentioned, we're out of time. I want to thank the, uh, the panel. Uh, and as you have more questions, please uh, grab these guys in the hallway. I think everybody will be around all week. Uh, as mentioned, we'll have an unconference session. And I thank everybody and enjoy the evening and the reception.